Secondly, wise leaders experience um, God's favor through others. Look, if you will, in verse one so, of chapter 47. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come down from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. Right? Get them over to the land of Goshen. Get them like, place them where you want them, right? And from his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation, right? Isn't that something that, like, what is that about, like, guys in particular, like, sizing each other up all the time? What is your occupation, right? And I've told you before, like, I just, I want to dig a hole and die when somebody asks me what my occupation is. You say, well, why? Stand proud as a pastor. Well, do you realize the kind of, like, image that pastors have? It's like if you're a lawyer, a pastor, or a car salesman. So I've told you before, when I'm on a plane and someone asks me what I do, I just say something like, oh, I'm an astronaut, retired. <laughs> and I just sit in that because it feels so good to see the way they look at me. And I'll be like, yeah, I've been retired for a little while. I've done a couple space tours. One time I said, I'm a brain surgeon. And the person's jaw dropped. They're like, you're a freaking brain surgeon? I said, yeah, I've been working on the brain. You know, brain surgeon. <laughs> And I just play with it, and then eventually I go, just kidding, I'm actually a pastor. And then that's when they, like, open the window up and just shut me out for the rest of the... But what ends up happening is at least in that moment they've thought, okay, well, he's got some humor with them because I don't want them to have a... I don't know what stereotype. When I say I'm a pastor, I don't know what they're thinking. Like, God forbid they think uh, that, like, oh, so you wear a white suit and smack people over the forehead at church on Sundays, right? Um... But nevertheless, I digress, and you stress, and I make a mess, and I look for the next verse. <laughs> so Joseph went and he told him, and guess what? They are now in the land of Goshen, verse 2, and from his brothers, he took five of them, right? He, Pharaoh said, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds. And so basically what ends up happening is Pharaoh hooks a brother up, right? He, he hooks Joe up and Joe gets the hook up and his people get the land. Now here's what's amazing about this. Here's Joseph, you know, God used him in such amazing ways to take care of Pharaoh and all of the land and his people and now he returns the favor, now, Pharaoh acts a little bit differently because do you remember when the story happened between the cupbearer and the baker? And the baker, Joseph says, hey, remember me. Um, and he told, to the, or he told the cupbearer to remember him. But when the cupbearer got back before Pharaoh, he forgot him until later. Pharaoh wouldn't forget Joseph. He remembered Joseph. And that's pretty cool, especially when you see God's favor moving through non-believers. Think of Esther going before King Ahasuerus or Nehemiah going before Artaxerxes or Daniel going before Adarius. And you can see that God can even give people favor in your maybe non-believing work context. He can literally use people. Why is that? Because the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like channels of water, he directs it wherever he wishes. And so Pharaoh then ends up giving favor to him. And God can even use non-believers to be a blessing in our life. So don't be surprised by that, right? God's moral law is written on our heart. Can a non-believer um, you know, still do good things? Of course. You say, well, they're totally depraved of their sin. Everything that they do is marked by sin. We, okay, look, look, total depravity doesn't mean you're as bad as you can possibly be. It means you're as bad off as you can possibly be without the grace of God. So the, the reason we can see non-believers still do good things is because they're created in the image of God. The difference is a believer gives glory to God and credit to God for the good that comes out of their life, or a non-believer might think it's because of their own goodness, and that can reinforce them in being self-sufficient instead of being God-dependent. And so you have these wise leaders, and how cool Pharaoh is taking care of them. Third, wise leaders provide for family needs when possible. And that's actually something that I put in quality, or I put basically at the end, if possible, and here's why. 
take a look at verses 11 and 12. So in chapter 47, we see in verse 11, and what does it say? Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food according to the number of their descendants. And so it would have been real easy given the rejection, the betrayal, the selling them off into slavery to forever hate his brothers. But his brothers ended up basically recognizing their wrongdoing and there was reconciliation and that provided a way for Joseph to be able to help his family. So there's situations sometimes that that you all have to be aware of because the Bible will use language like, hey, the child that doesn't take care of his parent, the believer that doesn't take care of his parent, is worse than a non-believer. But here's the worst thing you can do as moms and dads. Don't ever have kids and then put the pressure on your kids to be your source of retirement. That is a burden that is overwhelming. It is hard enough to come up with your own retirement than to expect that to fall on your kids. Should kids help mom and dads when they're hurting? Of course. Here's Joseph. He's helping, right? There's a, there's a certain need. But sometimes what can happen, and we know some people that have been a part of our life, where we have went to great lengths to show help. We've tried to offer wisdom. Yet, when financial help's the only thing wanted and not exercising in wisdom and learning from mistakes and stuff like that, then you might get put in a position where you have to put some boundaries up. And then that can get really ugly and create family tension, and it can be really, really challenging. So in general, yes, we want to always be able to help our loved ones and our family. But we should also, like I know for Heather and myself, we are highly motivated to be in a position that someday when we pass, that our kids aren't stressed and worried about us and overcome and and carrying that um, in in their life. We want them to feel like, hey, there's going to be, they're okay. And I'm just saying that there are ways that families can fall apart when it starts coming to it. Like, oh, how the will's going to go down, how things are going to happen. And you have to be careful. We should always want to help, but when help is not wanted in a way that might have some boundaries, or when somebody runs through everything that they have, and then they don't want boundaries, and if you let them, they'll run through everything you have, that's when you have to go, man, Lord, help us. And that can be challenging. Well, here's a situation where Joseph, obviously, is the prime minister. He would have been able to save so much. He would have had all kinds of resources to be able to help out, obviously. And this was part of God's plan as well, to get God's people to flourish there in Egypt. 